All right, folks. Good evening, everybody. It's Steve with Real Progressives. Tonight, very fun topic, very fun guy. Um, I want to kind of set the stage for everybody uh, before we get too far into this. Maximilian Seo is somebody who I met in Kansas City during the uh, the uh, you, uh, MMT conference. And he put on an incredible presentation about a subject that most of us people that actually follow MMT get peppered with constantly. And this nonsense about Weimar Republic and hyperinflation. I mean, after a little while, it's kind of like, it's almost shameful that it keeps coming up, but it does. And we could do 40 shows on it. And there's still 350 million Americans out there that would rather believe the <laughs> would rather believe some other mystical tale than the actual one. Um, but the thing that I like most about Maximilian's uh, you know presentation was the fact that what he focused on was the humanities aspect of it. He focused on the propaganda that surrounded it. He, pro uh, he focused on all the aspects that led up to the actual hyperinflation that struck the Weimar Republic. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring on Max. Um, Max, let me get you freed up there, buddy. And we're going to bring you on right now. How are you doing, sir? I'm pretty good. So how did you get involved in economics, first of all? So coming out of high school, I actually spent some time abroad and, you know, became interested in politics and started following the Obama administration. And kind of through that influence and through social media, I kind of started to realize that economics was kind of important if we want to make change and really live in the world that we want to see. So when I got back from my year abroad after high school, I enrolled in the University of South Florida, where I studied economics. Now, I will say the program wasn't really uh, MMT friendly. It was straight orthodox nonsense. So um, I was thoroughly disillusioned by about my third year and I was already, you know, writing critiques online of, you know, kind of microeconomic nonsense and, you know, didn't really spot MMT at that point, but I knew something was wrong. And then uh, one day I was meeting with the professor and uh, a fellow MMTer. Uh, who happens to be a professor at the University of South Florida, Scott Ferguson, happened to walk by and listen to what I was saying, and the rest is history. <laughs> Scott's a great guy. I'm trying to sucker Scott into coming on the show as well. Scott seems to be a little bit more timid about this, but we're going to coax him out of his shell. And I'll help you out. I'll, I'll mention it. <laughs> All right. So let's get to the meat of the, the story here, because this is – I mean, first of all, you're very well put together. I was extremely uh, enthused and enthralled with your presentation. You spoke about a subject that MMTers are unfortunately straddled with constantly. And this is this idea of hyperinflation as my eyes roll back in my head. Um, you know, it, it's like that Robert Downey Jr. meme where he's like, <laughs> And that's how I feel every time somebody brings it. What are you going to do? Just print more money. And, you know, it, it, it kind of defies logic because once you realize the basics of economics, you realize that the scarcity is not in the pieces of paper. The scarcity is in the real resources that they can acquire. And, and, and so your presentation took me so much further. You know, I have a canned little speech that I give about the, the Weimar, which is basically – you know, Treaty of Versailles, debt denominated in French francs, productive capacity eliminated, uh, barrels of cash rolling through, none of it could buy a loaf of bread. Um, and then I go to Zimbabwe, I do a similar thing. Mugabe took all the farms away from the white farmers, gave it to the freedom fighters. Freedom fighters weren't exactly farmers. They were good at, you know, doing what they did, but they weren't really good at farming. So they lost like 60% of their productive capacity. There again, another production issue. Mm -hmm. uh, people try to compete for an era of corn, printing money, money in buckets, destroyed economy once again. And you can do that with other things like Venezuela, where they have a single, you know, 
industri industry that supports their entire economy. If there's any shocks to it, they're screwed. Uh, the fact that they've got their self pegged to the dollar is another issue in and of itself that straps them just like the gold standard would on and on and on. People don't understand these things. So this is why I brought you on because you do. And, and I want to hear the story of Weimar and, and, and just exactly as you told it before, buddy. Right. So I love all that that you said and that, you know, that gets us a certain, you know, percentage of the way to kind of explaining what, you know, what this hyperinflation thing even is. Right. Cause that's, that's the first thing that I always try and, you know, say is that it's different from inflation. So what happened in Weimar was it, it, when we talk about economics and we talk about its intersection with politics, right? We understand as MMTers that economics is a, a, a series of political choices about where to spend money, right? And, and that's what creates our economy and our employment structure. It was the same in Weimar, except coming off of World War I, it wasn't about, it wasn't Germany making those choices anymore. It was the allied forces and the French really took the lead uh, in the Treaty of Versailles to really make the decision to hobble and and really hurt the productive capacity of Germany going forward because they were afraid of another war um, because, you know, France and Germany have fought each other throughout the, you know, throughout time over and over and over again. So for, for France, it wasn't a question of if this was going to happen. It was a question of when. So they wanted to hurt Germany as much as they could. And they, they took territory, they, they curtailed populations through lack of support of infrastructure, just the war itself did that, took away a, you know, a large percentage of Germany's working age male population. Um, they seized iron, you know, their iron production, their coal production, their transport industry was destroyed, you know, all these things come together in this moment to really, you know, create a bad situation for, for the German economy. And then on top of that, they, like you said, and Frank, den Frank denominated debt, they layer on top of that these reparations that Germany has to pay that are some obscene amount of their total G GDP per year. And so what this ended up doing is essentially on purpose, France and America's, you know, was complicit in this, and as well as the UK, destroyed the German economy. They they thoroughly gutted its capacity to the point where Germany really didn't have an economy to speak of. So what ends up happening in the subsequent years is that when you do that, when you cut the economic capacity of a country like that, and they do print money or create money, uh, try and stay away from the printing language because you know, that, you know, that may be how it was done then, but that's not how we do it now. Um, it, 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 you know, the only result that we were gonna have is inflation. So it's really important to say that this wasn't a benign kind of event that occurred without the knowledge, without the, the foresight of the international community this was purposeful. So that's step one. And then step two, if we look all the way down the line of causative structures towards the money printing, that, that stuff's just, just insane. It's not, it's not what you do when you're trying to figure out what caused something. So if we're trying to say, well, Germany printed money and hyperinflation happened, so therefore we can't print money now, there, there is no corollary. They're completely different situations. So, um, and then on, on top of all that, because of this, there's political chaos, right? There's, there's a communist revolution that occurs shortly after the war. Um, and you know, this reflects in the culture, which is what I was kind of saying in Kansas City. So, you know, all these things coming together, they create a kind of a culture of economic privation and you know, the desolation of an economy that creates a hyperinflation, right? Which is completely different. Again, I'll say this again, completely different from regular inflation. 
So that's that's how that inflation process happens there in that moment. And, you know, I, I could go on and keep telling you how, you know, how that moves into the next period of the Weimar Republic. Um, but, you know, that's that's the story. That's what happened. And it's not like regular inflation. It's not like what we could have here in America in at present day. So I want to show you a graphic here real quickly that I'm sure will jump right out at you. I'm sure you've seen this before. Mm -hmm. um, and this right here, it, it, it's very small. I don't know if you can see it through the, the way the screen sets this up. But really what it shows is over a period of time, what happened to the actual quote unquote Reichmark. And, and you can see that it started out one for one in the original time. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden it shot up to like a million. To, I mean, that's over. I, I can't see it well enough to give you the exact. Sure. But the point is, is that there is a significant, you can see it spike upward. And that's where that hyperinflation hits. And, and so I guess, I guess for me, when I see something like that, um, I, I think to myself, wow, okay. That is scary as hell. I can certainly understand why people would be concerned with that. So when you explained the uh, the cause and effect, if you will, that brought Weimar into the situation that it that became, there's some things that bring about guttural fear. You can see that in our movement and progressives everywhere who don't understand economics, who get trapped in these buzzwords like hyperinflation, print money, blah, blah, blah. But these are things that tie back to something terrifying. The idea of not being able to survive no matter what you do. The idea of no amount of money is enough to be able to do what you need to do and being left to the wolves. Sadly, a lot of people would like to chase off into the woods collecting berries and do a similar type thing self-imposed. Right. But the reality is that this, this is a very serious issue to most people. I mean, even though it's probably never gonna happen in the United States, it would require significant dramatic shifts to both our political world, our productive capacity and our resource allocations. But how would you describe the the fears of the German people? It, it obviously sparked the rise of Adolf Hitler. And, and there were a great many other things that, you know, the, the time period showed as they tried to propagandize, if you will, the people into rising up and so forth. Talk about the, the feelings, the fear of a hyperinflation, how that impacted the German people, and maybe tie it into modern day folklore and the way people worried that the United States might fall into a similar uh, situation. Right, so specifically in that time, the, the psychological outlook of, you know, of the German populace at that time was, was quite grim, um, to say the least. And, when you see that chart that you showed, and I'm really glad you showed that chart, the the latter part of it, when the 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 line goes straight up, right? This is where Germans have lost a sense for what is real, for what for what government does, for what politics can do for them, right? This is really a psychological moment when, you know, all these things have happened, all this misery, and then all of a sudden, like you mentioned, this fear, you know, begins to take hold. And, you know, it, it, part of my part of my presentation in Kansas City talked about film. And I really like to say, like, horror film is invented in this time in Germany. You know, that maybe can give you a sense of you know, what people are feeling. The first ever horror movies, you know, Nosferatu, which kind of invented the horror genre, um, starts here. And and that's how they were feeling. They were scared. They, they really didn't know what to trust. And I can't help but say, you know, things are really bad now in America, but they're nowhere near the level of bad that you know, post-World War I Weimar Germany was. And so to, to kind of compare the two different psychologies, it's, it's almost 
incomparable. They, the, 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 the situation there was so bad that people lost the grasp for what was real, what it meant to, to, you know, to buy things, to trust their government, to trust what was going to happen on the, on the day after the next. So when you, when you talk about German inflation, you really just have to understand the scope and the depth of the seriousness of the desolation of their economy. And, and, you know, we, we, we take for granted perhaps that, you know, even though things are very bad, we can still go down to the local store and buy something. And there is food there and, you know, and we can go and fill up gas or have, have electricity. We're talking about a lot of instances, you know, the coal that they had, it was gone. So when, when we're talking about German hyperinflation, you just have to understand we can't project our our cultural moment onto that moment and say that we were really close to that in any way because we aren't. And so when we talk about the hyperinflation, it's of a distinctly different quality than any kind of inflation we have in America. And we've had even even the inflation of the 70s that we had. So. I'm going to go ahead and put this image up on the screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. What it, it it's just a quote by James Baldwin, um, but I think it's fitting as to what occurs with austerity and what occurs when you have such draconian economic crushing, uh, you know, circumstances that hit anywhere, whether it be in the United States or whether it be in the Eurozone or whether it be in Greece or wherever. These countries, when you see them reacting and acting out, there is nothing more dangerous. The most cre dangerous creation of any society is the man who has nothing to lose. And, and that right there, you know, quite frankly, that is the uh, I, I look at that and I say, that's how Adolf Hitler rose. That, that right there, that that feeling of hopelessness grips people and they do things they would not otherwise do. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people, they, they can't think beyond Boolean ones and zeros. But the reality is many people that voted for Donald Trump were not racist bigots. They were people that despised the neoliberal Hillary Clinton. And they were people that absolutely did not want to see the status quo. They didn't want to see the establishment, if you will. Now, mind you, they got a freaking buffoon and he's a horrible guy and all the other stuff that you have to say just so people won't think that you're saying something other than what you're saying. Um, but, but here's a situation where in our own country, we've got a madman at the helm based on what I consider to be the fallout of the great global financial crisis, the great recession that hit the United States, people feeling desperate and destitute and misplacing, not understanding the economics of the situation. So they're looking all over, pointing at all these different, as Ellis Winningham would say, orphaned politics, all these like symptoms. Mm -hmm. and, and when you try and explain to them that this fundamental thing is causing the z much of the xenophobia is brought on by austerity. Much of the scapegoating is brought on by austerity and a lack of good jobs. Much of the problems and pain we suffer from in society today is a lack of fiscal policy brought on by the fears of Milton Friedman, who made us all believe we're going to have horrible inflation if we spent money and created money, and going back to Zimbabwe and Weimar Republic. I mean, they have used these scare tactics to make us be good children, staying quietly, you know, just sitting still and accepting breadcrumbs. Only problem is they've cut too close to the bone now and people are literally destitute. Um, so when you think about the impact of the propaganda of the time and you look at the synergies between the United States today and Weimar Republic yesterday, there's some cautionary tales there, I think, for people that don't understand economics, that they should really wrap their mind around this. Because this is not just, oh, God, they're talking economics again. No, we're talking about Adolf Hitler. We are talking about Weimar Republic. 
And we are talking about things that are a psychological phenomenon as much as anything. Talk a little bit about, if you can see the similarities, lay out what you see as similar in, in terms of the propaganda, et cetera, and lay out what is not similar so that people cannot be fearful, if you will. Right. So, you know, as far as to assuaging fears, you know, unfortunately, we live in a desperate time. So we'll see how, how well I do at that. But um, when I talk, you know, what you were saying really reminded me of this story of, you know, a little bit later on in the Weimar Republic, after the inflation is tamping down and, um, you know, the depression really hits, hits, hits Germany. And, you know, at that time, there is a center right government in power. Um, a man by the name of Heinrich Brüning was the chancellor of Germany. And he was in, Aust in Austerian. He, he really believed in austerity. And his answer to the Great Depression was to force deflation, right? He was so scared of inflation, which, you know, for, for maybe for those who aren't necessarily so, you know, economically inclined, that essentially means he forced, he was wanted to force wage cuts and layoffs so that businesses could perhaps stay afloat by only, you know, having their employees live on po poverty wages. And he thought that that would fix the depression and the great crisis that was going on. Well, turns out it didn't. It only made things far worse. And in that time, his, you know, his inaction and his brutal austerity, you know, left an opening for an election that came up between the far left and the far right. Now, when you talk about, you know, even, you know, real progressives, right? Th that's this whole, the whole notion of this channel is to educate progressives about the true nature of economics, right? And we, we, they, the Weimar Republic needed a real progressives of its own because the left in this battle up against the Nazis, right? In this, in this kind of penultimate election where Hitler ultimately, you know, one is maybe a strong, strong way to put it, but ended up taking over power as a result of three subsequent elections. They decided against a plan that was put in, that was offered up by this, these trade unionist block of the left, of the, of the SPD, which was the, the socialist party in Germany, continued, continues to be to this day. And essentially there is, financial spokesmen from the SPD sort of put put to the side what's called the WTB plan, which is which was essentially a new deal for Germany. It was a, an expansive public works plan that was pioneered by the free trade unionists of that time to put Germany to work, right? And the, and the free trade unionists wanted to run on this platform to put Germany to work. But the kind of establishment in the left said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna run on what we usually run on, which is in that time, just nationalization of heavy industry and banking nationalization, essentially, you know, and the Fed. So, and, and they didn't end up running on that. And you know who did run on public works? You know who did run on, you know, this putting Germany back to work? Hitler did, yep. right? So. You know, now obviously goes without saying he did this in the most, you know, in, in the worst way possible and as racist and as horrible as could possibly be. But he put Germans back to work after he was elected. Right. That was like you said, a man who's desperate, as James Baldwin says, will they'll do anything. They'll reach out for anything. So what what they ended up doing was they they were desperate. And a lot of them, you know, they ignored the bigotry. Right. Which is, you know, we should say that. But they they voted for Hit Hitler because they, they felt like no one was caring for them. I want to I want to bring up a meme here real quickly. And I, I thought about not bringing it up, but I'm going to bring it up because I think it's perfect for what we're talking about. Um, this right here is an Aldous Huxley quote. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and take away the banner so we can read it all the way through. He says, the propagandist purpose is to make one set of people forget that certain other sets of people are human. And, you know, this goes back to something else, and I'm going to drop all, all this down so it's just you and I again. Um, but, you know, we're looking at, like, for right now, you're looking at the NFL, and you're hearing a lot of talk about Colin Kaepernick, and you're watching the reactions of the 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 hatred, the hatred, this extreme nationalism, this extreme you know structured patriarch or uh, you know uh, patriotism, etc., hyper patriotism, hyper nationalism, and and talking about these colors don't run, and you know all all of a sudden people are kneeling down during the the whatever, and of course you got Mike Ditka out there saying horrible things, you got Donald Trump saying horrible things. You got friggin' every one of these Reich wingers saying horrible things about a guy who's merely protesting the the poor treatment of African Americans, and not just African Americans. Ironically, it's all peoples that are being affected by this. All all uh, you know minorities, if you will, that are being impacted by this um, this mindset and this mindset of scapegoating and scapegoating, xenophobia, racism. Uh, you know homophobia, all these different boogeymen that we latch on to. Some of it comes from biblical uh, misunderstandings and some of it comes straight up from what, this is what fascism does. This is fascism. It's, it needs an enemy. It needs scapegoat. It needs something to point at and say, you're the problem. We're all good over here. You're the problem. And, and so I, I think that what Hitler did, and, and I want you to keep me honest here because I'm not a historian, but what I watched as I've read and so forth, you know, Hitler basically had to find a scapegoat. And what did he do? He found the Jewish banksters and the Jewish people and, you know, really, really used Juden and, you know, put, making them, putting marks on them to dehumanize them, as Aldous Huxley said. This is what they did. They propagandized this to give the German people, something to rally around, something to to dig into. And, and this is the essence of fascism. And it's also an outcome of extreme austerity because this would have never happened. This wouldn't, there wouldn't even be an opportunity for such a thing. Um, the night of the long knives wouldn't have occurred if, if such brutal conditions from the Treaty of Versailles had not indeed happened. So, I guess I guess what I'm asking you is I'm trying to strike the parallels where they where they matter to show the scapegoating and to show the way that we do things in America even today that relate to that and also trying to divide a, a very clear line that says that hyperinflation thing isn't happening but talk about the scapegoating if you will right okay so when so when we're talking about you know what Hitler did and what the the right wing in Germany did Again, I think it, it, is, it is worth putting into context to say that we don't have in America a such a vibrant right-wing nationalism as they did in Germany at that time. That doesn't mean that we don't have right-wing nationalists. And that doesn't mean we, we don't have to be vigilant in our politics to make sure that we rebuff them. But so in, in that context, when we talk about kind of the way the way the financial crisis in 2008, you know, we really have to talk about the elimination of wealth and, and the elimination of, you know, the ability for people to, to maintain good wages, you know, have jobs that aren't part time without benefits. You know, everyone, everyone knows this common story. And I, I really think, you know, there's really something to be learned about you know, the, the way the left treated Hitler and the way the left in, in America is treating Donald Trump. And we really have to understand that we, we must embrace the power of money to put people to work, right? To, to not leave any human behind, right? To not dehumanize like fascism does. And, and the, the left in the Weimar Republic disavowed that power. They disavowed their ability 
to really change things and to really put their entire populace to work. And when you disavow that for long enough, and when you disavow a system of modern money that can really do things that nobody before it, before modern money thought that governments could do, um, we really leave ourselves open to demagogues and to right wings like Donald Trump that can scapegoat, you know, Mexicans or, or African Americans and, you know, tell people like, look, things are bad. And the, this is the reason why. And what the left needs to do, right, is take, is take the historical context and learn from it and be able to say things are bad and we can fix it because we have the power of modern money at our disposal and we understand it and we can put everyone to work and give everyone health care. And, and the, left, the left in this last election, you know, the Democratic Party and the left of Weimar both disavowed that power, right? They disavowed, as Stephanie Kelton say, say, would say, right? The government's ability to give everyone a pony. And they do that to, to everyone's, you know, it, there's consequences for everyone when the left does that. So it, it really, you can't, you can't underestimate the level of which the consequences for disavowing our monetary power, are they're just so high. I'm going to show you another uh, image. I think this is a good one that shows the damage done by these myths and legends. This right here is like, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. And, and you see this, it's kind of a joke, obviously, but you see Democrats who have run on the Wall Street, uh, you know, coattails. You see Republicans who live every step along the way of unfettered capitalism. You see the LOL Bertarians who succumb to this whole anarcho-capitalism that is like, you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you how bad that is. But, but this right here, we don't understand because we refuse. I mean, Max, when, we, when I say refuse, I'm telling you there is a brutal addiction to economic illiteracy. People want to stay stuck. And, and, and because of that, I, I lose, oh, I'm going to go 99% of the respect for people that I see fist in the air, fighting about the environment, fighting about racial justice, fighting about police brutality, fighting about the rents too high, fighting about minimum wage and all these other things. When they all, if you like follow the breadcrumbs back, it takes you straight back to the economic narrative. It takes you straight back to state theory of money. It takes you straight back to functional finance and it takes you back to good old fashioned. The government is the creator of the US dollar in the conditions of the United States. And we can never go broke based on debt denominated in our own currency. This takes us back to Weimar once again, because Weimar obviously had debt denominated in French francs. But we are at a time right now if the left is really the left, if the left really believes what it says it believes, we are, we've are we got major environmental disasters coming through. I'm going to drop this. Uh, actually, no, I'm, not. I'm going to just go ahead and make it so we're all three on there. Um, we got situation, we've got major environmental disasters coming. We've already seen wildfires out of control in Sonoma and California. We've seen major hurricanes pouring through Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico and, and Miami and the Virgin Islands and all, all throughout the, um, the, uh, the South. We have literally watched much, much arid conditions and water is in uh, scarcity in, in the, the West and the Midwest. We've got situations where we literally are watching the very things that the left claims they care about. And then I sit there and I try to tell them, guys, we live in a monetary economy. In order for us to be able to solve those problems, we must unleash the power of fiat. We must unleash the power of our national currency, a.k.a. the public's money. And we need to be able to satisfy these very serious needs because we're going to see insanity crop up like Vegas and other places where people who have no hope, 
people who are angry and desperate start doing desperate things. Now, I don't know anything about the motivation behind the guy in Vegas. So I don't want to even get down that rabbit trail. But the point I'm making is, is that when you see people who are desperate, they do desperate things. And what the left does, and this in, just infuriates me, the left wants to chastise and hate the people that are losing it, that are freaking losing their mind right now, instead of pointing at the problem, which is our government strangling the economy, just like not from the German perspective, but because of France's imposition of the Treaty of Versailles, basically what they did to them and what's happening to Greece right now, et cetera. Um, I, I, there was a lot of word salad right there, but if you can go ahead and just give a commentary based on that, <laughs> that whole jumbled mess I just threw at you, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So, I mean, right. Yes. I mean, look, you know, the, the one thing that I always think of is, was when people say, you know, when talk about the job guarantee and they talk about, you know, well, what would people do? Right. You know, look, there's so much to do, right? We need to retrofit, you know, environmentally every single house and building in this entire country, right? We need to invest resources, human capital in all sorts of renewable technologies. We need to change out the pipes in Flint, Michigan, Yes. And, in, and in, you know, in hundreds of other cities across the country, there's so much to do. Right. And and like you, like this, this graphic says, right, the planet got destroyed, but we created a lot of shareholder value. Well, you know, we can we can stop the planet from getting destroyed. I live in Florida and Tampa and, you know, I, you know, many of my friends and family had to flee because they were in flood zones from these from the hurricanes, right? I had to batten down my windows and, you know, buy all sorts of supplies and, you know, get gas stoves just because this hurricane was coming through. And we should expect more of them and much worse, right? So th this, is, this is a profoundly important moment for the American people to really begin to understand that employment and unemployment are both creatures of the state. And we must realize that and employ the power of state money to try and mitigate the impending disaster that we have coming and, and if that's just talking about environmentalism, right? We could talk, we could talk about 10 other different, you know, problems and disasters that exist or that will exist. But without the realization that employment is a governance project, we will not get there. So I, I'm gonna, g give me one second. I wanna pull up a, uh, a thread. Um, I'm not gonna be able to pull it up onto the screen, unfortunately. I could, but I'm not gonna do it. I, I, I'm afraid it would end up screwing up. But there's a thread that um, another MMT -er put up in another group that I'll just kind of leave uh, nebulous. But I want to read this. And, and, and this just tells you how bad things are. I mean, this, this is like crazy. There, the, people are saying that uh, MMT is the third way launching a 20 million new blue campaign to battle Trumpism. Uh, th this, is, this is the left. And these are people that claim to be progressives saying this stuff. And then trying to say that uh, we need a certain amount of, uh, here, the, the job guarantee program sounds like a wonderful program that create millions of new jobs that will help rebuild infrastructure. And I'm completely on board with that idea. The David Brock Third Way article, which I attached, discusses the Democrats' plan for a new economic plan. That plan will include the jobs guarantee, and it will be coupled with a new economic plan, which is MMT. I'm not on board with MMT in conjunction with the new jobs guarantee because it's dangerous to get 0% or even close to 0% unemployment rate when MMT has been implemented because hyperinflation is virtually guaranteed. This is the level, dude, this is the level of moronic, I mean, we are talking about diseased mind, like worms eating away at the brain, 
kind of level of stupid. And I have, I just can't even be kind about it because the information is so readily available, but yet they would rather presume to teach those who have done the homework. They would rather presume to teach than presume to be a student for once. And, and then be, oh, he's so mean to them. Just so mean to them, such a meanie. Well, I look at it like this. I look around and I see people suffering. I look around and I see people without teeth in their mouth because their teeth are rotting from not having the money to go to the dentist. I see people who have diseases and, and friggin' big, huge friggin' tumors on their head and on their arms. Uh, if I could afford it, I'd go ahead and get it removed, man. But I just don't have the money for it, man. And, and then I see people that are literally divorcing and fighting with each other because of horrific financial strain. And, and I say to myself, do I give a crap about that person that doesn't understand economics, that gets brutally wounded when you call them out for their laziness, quite frankly? Or do I get more offended by the person who's dying, whose family is about to be decimated, whose children are going to be without good quality nutrition, and people who claim to want a new deal, claim to want student loan debt, all these things, all these grand things. But then when they come back to it, they nickel and dime. Let's go for a fight for 15. And um, you know, what, what out of UBI instead? And um, and they it's like, what the hell, man? What is wrong with you? And the reality is they don't want to learn. They're very content just saying things. Barroom chatter, eating the friggin' mixed bowl of nuts and drinking a beer while they're talking about whatever nonsense. Cheeto, Lini, you name it. Distractagons. How in the world can we make people understand how severely life ending and life changing austerity measures are and the fact that we do have the ability to change this immediately but will not how how would you make that pitch because i'm at my wits end with progressives who refuse to learn refuse refuse to learn it right so yeah i mean that you know certainly the problem of our time and and you know it's it's tough. The one thing I would say um, is kind of what I alluded to before is when when you know people people maybe have a vague sense that the government can print money, right? There's maybe some vague sense of it out in the ether somewhere, right? But what people maybe don't understand, and what's maybe a bit more radical, is to say that all employment is a product of the state and state money. And when you go and you work for, you know, Costco or Walmart, you are earning state money. And without the state, you would not be earning that money, right? So it's not just about creating new money. It's about the whole system. That's, you know, all the money that already is in circulation is all state money. So, it you know, when people say, you know, and, and just to go to that specific example, when people talk about 0% unemployment, I mean, it's worth noting that it's factually wrong. And obviously, you know, the easiest example of that is if you look to World War II America, when, when, when we really, really felt that it was worth putting everyone to work for something. We did. We just did. And you know what we did? There wasn't inflation. So, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a sense that we just don't care, which, which is kind of what you were alluding to. And I think, I think there, there's really something to say about the way we fragment our society, whether it's media ecosystems, or on cell phones, so you know, to 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 the perspective where we really just don't see. We only talk to the people that we want to talk to, and we just don't see what's going on in other communities. You know, segregation. There's all these things that have fragmented the American people. Um, so you know, as far as a simple answer, you know, I, I wish I had one. Um, I really think the work that you're doing is is really you know important on this on this trek. And, and what I see is most radical about MMT is this move to say that employment is, is a state project. 
always, forever, and, and it is never not. And unemployment is, is just in, in the inverse of that, in, in that it is also a state project, but it's just an instance of where the state is leaving people behind. Uh, beautifully, beautifully stated. So one of the things that I think it would be helpful to us, um, you know, as I look around, I, I, I recognize a gaping hole in the diversity within not just the MMT community, but economics as a whole. There it is largely male dominated, white male dominated profession. And I don't think that it's that way on purpose. It just happens to be the way that is falling out. But there's a host of reasons, I'm sure, why that are valid reasons that you can track through archaeologically and show why. But the fact is, is that they are very underrepresented. And I know that, um, uh, is it Darity? Um, wrote a really great article in Jacobin, um, an African-American. I don't know that he is actually a... Um, MMT or, but I think he's adjacent or getting there or close, whatever. Bottom line is he supports a job guarantee. But we need to be able to give this information to uh, impacted communities, uh, communities that are destitute and that need some self-empowerment to feel like they can make things happen. Because MMT to me is hope. It is ground zero of a new tomorrow. And it is here now. That's the best part. It doesn't require a million. Well, we'll go ahead and help you out after we end the Fed and after we go ahead and green the dollar and after we go ahead and pass the Need Act and after we go ahead and do this and that and the other, then we'll go ahead and save a couple lives. No, this is right here, right now. And so some of the things, I mean, you know, we spitball for a minute. You know, some of the things that I've heard in my communications with Black Lives Matter and others Things like they want to see changes, substantive changes to the police force and substantive changes to how they police, community policing, etc. And I keep thinking one of the primary things that we should be looking at there is how those police departments are funded. If you go to Ferguson, you see that they were largely funded based on ticky tack fines and chasing people around and putting boots on cars and getting people for jaywalking and anything else they could get them for. And it was the way that they survived. That, that is not a, a symbiotic relationship between community and protect and serve. Okay. And you see that elsewhere too. You see that mostly in high density uh, urban communities that are largely minority affected and MMT is provides answers that they can do as well. I mean, I'm not for or against this because we have to really dig to figure out what it means to make whole. But even reparations would be possible once you understand how our currency works. It, it's not like you have to make someone less whole to make someone else whole in this case. And I think that's instructive because, you know, you go to Appalachia. And you see these white people without shoes and teeth are missing and living in the basement of poverty in themselves. And you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, hold on. I thought it's like, no, most people in America that are impoverished are white. Most poor people are white. So this is something that is really universal. But communities of color in particular that need to be able to change the fundamental trajectory of their communities I mean, here's an opportunity to give them a job guarantee that allows them complete mobility. They pick up one day. If you're not going to fix my water here in Michigan, I'm going to Denver. You know, you're not going to go ahead and take care of making sure we have jobs here and, and good quality schools. <clears throat> I'm going where they are. And, and one of the other things, and I, I want to let you talk, but one of the other things that's of concern is we watch how different states petition corporations to flee from this area down to Texas, leave Buffalo, come to Texas, leave Pittsburgh, come to Texas, leave wherever, come to here. And, and you see them doing the race to the bottom because states are funded by taxation and bonds and other tools, whereas the federal government is not. So the same flight that you see, the capital flight that the left, that socialists and particular Marxists talk about, Maybe not so prevalent in a fiat regime where you're talking at the national level, but on a state to state level where you don't have 
that flexibility where you are a currency user. I mean, why wouldn't we federally fund all mandates, get rid of any unfunded mandates to make sure that there is no incentive for company A to leave state A and go to company or state B? You, you know what I'm saying? There shouldn't be a tax-based incentive for people to make destitution over here to create you know, prosperity over there. It shouldn't be a lose-lose proposition like that. Right. Right. And the existence of that lose-lose proposition is essentially a choice by the federal government to, you know, to preference that sort of system. Because, again, I mean, the government, through power of fiat and regulation, could make, could equalize all of those things if it wanted to. Right. But like, and I think you made, you made a couple really great points. One of them was, comes down to police departments. Right. And these petty fines and dues that the city was was taking in, you know, in Ferguson to essentially fund their police department, right? That is a clear example, right? And that, that doesn't, and, and what I'm about to say doesn't necessarily mean I'm arguing for the full funding of the Ferguson Police Department by the federal government, because a lot of things have to change inside the department and the culture and that sort of thing as, as well. But... This is an instance of where a lack of knowledge in MMT and, and the, you know, from the federal to the state to the local level is enabling this racist retribution and this pervasive unequal system to, to, to be even worse than it would be left to its, you know, left to its own natural state, right? Whatever that is. So, you know, in, it all comes down to the fact that the federal government is the price setter, right? Many MMTers say this, right? This is one of the, the most important parts of MMT in my mind, right? And anything that goes on, whether it's employment, you know, wages, what police departments are fining you, this is all a function of either action or non-action by the federal government in their regulatory or money producing capacities. All right. So I want to I want to touch on something else too that that is that is a little infuriating, right? The idea of our jobs leaving the country. This is nonsense. Let, let, let's I want to talk through this because the reason why we don't have people ridiculously well employed right now has zero to do with the lack of work being available. It's everything to do with a lack of political will. I work in an industry where I get to see the roadways and bridges and I get to see the infrastructure crumbling and I get to see the ratings and I get to see the facts that there's just not enough money to do everything that needs to be done to make our infrastructure right. So you can go ahead and twist ties on a Tootsie Pop over there in China till the cows come home. If you want to go ahead and bang on a rim for a car wheel, knock yourself out in Brazil or wherever. But in the United States, if we had free college, the amount of universities, the amount of computers, the amount of teachers, the amount of work that would come, custodians even, whatever, right? I mean, maybe they would do remote school, teleschool, whatever school. But the point is, is that there would be an abundance of economic activity that would create jobs instantly. The next one, and I, this, this drives me batty, if we get a national health care service, forget Medicare for all, let's go all out, baby. You know, if we went that route, the amount of gurneys, the amount of x-ray machines, the amount of beds and hospitals and, you know, medicine and whatever, I mean, it would go through the roof. All of a sudden, there would be jobs out the wazoo in the medical profession. So now we just went ahead, we addressed infrastructure, we addressed medical, we addressed education. And now let's talk about the environment. If we wanted to, and this is why it always kills me when people go, we got to soak the rich and we got to go after the, the corporations for their money. Not because I don't want to do whatever. The point is, is that do it smart. Use Pagovian taxes to get what you're trying to get. You're not trying to fund anything with their taxes. So let's use them for what they're there for. And the, the way we can use these things is to incent and to disincent, if you will, de -incent, whatever the word is, to, uh, to push away, to, to penalize behavior that is not good for America. And, and so rather than just arbitrarily, you know, raising taxes on corporations, 
let's start attaching behavior modifications to certain taxation. And, and all of a sudden now, you know, these jobs that these people are worried about are not the ones that matter. We, we, we don't need to be a production-based economy. Stop trying to elevate capitalism. We've got a lot of public purpose spending, as Pavlina would say. Public purpose has been completely missed. High-speed rail. Think about that. I mean, there's so many things. Water purification systems throughout America. We could even invest, like you said earlier, and subsidize not just houses being changed out for the electric they use, but every single smokestack in the United States, every car, we could sit there and stimulate that right out the door. And there would be tons of work, tons of work. People have no imagination and they literally don't know economics. So they worry about jobs leaving the country. It is that kind of stuff that literally keeps us stuck in the Eugene V. Debs world instead of moving closer and closer to a modern economy that supports the needs of the people. I'm sorry, I was a little bit of a tirade there, but if you want to address that, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, no, no worries. That was really well said. And, you know, I, I'm going to kind of bring this back into my wheelhouse a little bit. So, you know, all those things, right, we've gone over them. This is what we can do, right? And one of the things that I think of, you know, how to get there is we really need to change the discourse, right? From, from kind of, you know, more small areas on the web, in blogs, in chat rooms, to the New York Times, to CNN, to Fox News, right? All these places need to be aware of MMT and its potentials. And in the humanities, I can't help but think if we kind of double down on MMT, the way Marxism was sort of doubled down on from an educational perspective, right? Everyone who takes a humanities class or multiple or philosophy class in college will read Marx, right? They'll read, they'll read, you know, all these leftists. They'll also read, you know, Thoreau and all, you know, other people on the other side. But if we can get this stuff taught at the college level, at the high school level, at the middle school level, from all different avenues, right? We can, you know, what, where do these people who end up in the media, what do they study, right, when they go to college? English, cultural studies, you know, sometimes film. If we can get MMT, you know, everywhere, division of labor in a pluralistic perspective, we can start infiltrating these kind of mainstream organs of discussion in ways that perhaps if we just focus on you know, you know, saying government is the price setter or saying, you know, they're, you know, functional finance or things like this, we might not be able to reach as broad of, of an audience as we would. So, you know, to, to enable, if we're going to be able to do all the things that you said, if we're going to get the political will, we need broad understanding. And right. And just as, you know, employment is a governance project, so is education. Right. And we need to to employ a, a sort of MMT education and really get that pervasive and out there, you know, similarly to the way that that anti-fascists did after World War Two. You know, there, it, there's kind of a broad history of of intellectuals putting out their their method and changes to the way they view the world through the university, through the high school classroom. And I just really think that that's such an important part about this whole story. We need everything, but that's also for me that, and that's where, that's where my world is. And I think we need that as well. Uh, dude, I, I got to tell you, this was a very exciting interview for me. And I, 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 I love the fact that my world expanded, getting to meet folks like you um, in Kansas city was just a, a really, really nice thing. Um, I'd love to be able to have you come back sometime. I just think that there's so much more that could be said and you're just really, really good with this. I, I think you did a great job tonight. So I want to thank you very thank much. You. for, uh, for love joining. to come back and talk more. Absolutely. So if you would like uh, to part with uh, explaining anything that's going on in your world for people to follow you or whatever, or, or, you know, whatever, I'll leave you with the last word. Yeah, so um, if you're interested in kind of the musings of, you know, MMT and humanities, you can follow me on Twitter at Max Seho. Um, 
And you know, you can also just reach out, reach out to me if you have any questions about this world or you know the humanity's place in this world. And uh, you know, hope to come back and talk to you all very soon. Very good, Max. Thank you so much, buddy. You have a great night, and we'll talk to you soon.